So um, again, thank you. And when I was putting this presentation together, I was trying to think how to start and how I might relate a little bit to the Swedish experience and when the last time I was around this many Swedish people. And then I remembered that I was at the Olympics and we got to see, we didn't get to see Canada, US, but we did get to see Sweden and that was exciting because we love the Swedish hockey players. So a little bit of fun. Okay. So today we're, we're going to talk about federation, we're going to talk about what the problem space is, why we're all here and what we're trying to solve. So this is a problem, obviously. Um, people are managing their passwords with pieces of paper that they're carrying around and putting in drawers and putting in places just waiting to be found. Um, so how can we solve this problem and how can we get economies of scale and return of investment and get past this kind of solution into something more advanced, um, both for enterprise systems, public systems, and for the user. So I'll tell you first about the Kintyre Initiative, about our identity assurance framework, about our certification programs, and where we're going moving forward. So I hope the Swedish is right. I tried to have a little bit in there, but forgive me if it's not. Um, so a little bit of the mission of Kantara, um, we're supporting privacy, so we're developing solutions that enable um, identity-based pr and privacy respecting online interactions, and we're doing that through best practices and through actual criteria which can be used as a baseline to measure privacy. Building trust uh, through through trust frameworks which actually interfederate, which allow us to leverage the federations that are already existing and kind of connect them together and scale uh, interoperability that way. Um, and through open community. And so I'll tell you that Kintara actually means bridge in Swahili. One of our Japanese members came up with that, so put that all together. Um, and what we do at Kintara is we, we work to bridge. We work to bridge communities. So whether that's, um, say, a SAM, SAML community to OpenID community, or whether that's uh, North America to Asia, North America to Europe, Europe to Asia, whether that's enterprise to user-centric, so, uh, and technology to policy. So, so we try to use our ecosystem to, to bridge all of these communities together to harmonize solutions. So we're one of many groups in the space, um, and where we are separate, uh, find ourselves to be a bit separate, is that area of harmonization and really trying to pull all of the solutions together. We believe that there are many solutions out there around federation, um, be they protocol or policy, and that really the key is kind of bringing those solutions together. Um, and, and so we also see ourselves as a um, as a place to foster uh, the, the market for federation and as a place to foster uh, standards formation. Uh, so we give a place to kind of bring these different communities together and um, have an idea and start to do some work. But what we do is we give it an open environment where you can go today and kind of look at all of the work that we're doing in Kintara. Um, but we give it in a controlled environment where the stakeholders can choose their IPR. Um, the IPR is tracked such that the work that we do is actually able to go then and be contributed directly into organizations like ISO or ITUT or IETF. So those organizations will not accept work that hasn't been vetted for IPR and, and gone through some sort of kind of standards development process. So we make sure that, that the work that we do is well vetted and has that process so that it can go on to international standards bodies as well. So just a quick snapshot of some of our members. You can see that we have members from all different regions, Asia, Europe, um, North America. So we've got a lot of coverage. We also have a lot of different verticals. We've got financial, healthcare, uh, government agencies, uh, um, research and, and education networks as well. So, so we have a broad coverage of stakeholders, both from um, inter both internationally and um, from many different verticals as well. And we have active liaisons. Uh, we work with with ISO, with ITUT, um, OASIS, to name a few. We work with OIX as well. Um, and at times, we actually do. Um, 
we actually do reviews on specific government programs, which governments have approached us and said, hey, we're, we're working on this program. Could you have a look at this and, and provide us with some input to try to move it forward? Sometimes those reviews are confidential, sometimes they're not. Um, so, so we liaise in those ways, and our members in that way are able to review these documents, which are often confidential, um, and you need to be part of a member state or a member section to access. So we liaise in that way. Okay, so I can tell I'll, I'll talk about the programs later. Um, so we have one side that's around certification and programs around trust frameworks and assurance um, and interoperability. And then we have another side, this other side to the organization is around uh, work groups. And that's kind of, that's where the standards development um, activity takes place. And we actually have a, a healthy group of work groups around policy uh, that are working on specific policies that are working on uh, jurisdictional issues, how to get across, how to get across borders, how to get across um, states or provinces or municipalities, uh, and also groups that are focused specifically, specifically on the end user experience. Um, so we've got a good cross section there. Some of our groups are actually uh, working specifically in technical interoperability, um, and some of them are not necessarily touching interoperability, but maybe in the future. Um, so I won't go through every one of these being conscious of time, um, but I believe this presentation will be available after, and, and you can find out more about these groups and, and the participants that are, that are in these groups, um, perhaps after. So why is all of this interesting uh, for governments at this point? Um, interesting for enterprise as well, but why interesting for governments? Uh, so we know that the, the Swedish uh, E delegation has been giving uh, a lot of thought and attention in terms of where they want to go uh, as with federation as a solution uh, and what kind of savings and, and return of investment that that will bring in Sweden. Uh, we've seen the same in Canada, uh, particularly around cloud federation. They've identified they can save at least 100 million to 2 million in a year, and that's just in a specific set of servers. So when you scale that, we're talking in the billions of dollars that can be saved through federation. The United States has also been looking at uh, the Open Identity initi Initiative for uh, Open Government which is a program that seeks to reuse industry credentials uh, to interact, industry issued credentials to interact with government agencies and government services. Um, so this is just three examples. There are more, but uh, governments are more and more looking at federation, cloud federation, trust frameworks as a solution to, to save money and also to provide better access um, for their citizens to be a part of the network and to access their, their healthcare benefits or their government services or government agencies. So one thing that I want to mention is that in, in this work that we've been doing around federation, um, higher education network, higher education community is a community that has really kind of led the way in this space. Um, we'll be talking with their, uh, some people from Edugain. In Common is another, uh, is also a, a higher education federation, Calmar II, and Leif will talk to us about SWAM ID. So uh, this is the higher education community is a community that has found a common goal and a common need um, and a real uh, successful use case in terms of using federation to connect students and teachers to educational resources. So we, th they're a good example. Okay, so this is all, this meeting is about federation. And when I talk about trust frameworks, the big key for trust frameworks is that they provide a way to, uh, to interfederate, to, to get interfederation to happen. And what that does is that you're actually leveraging, will be able to leverage all of these networks that are already existing. So we have a way of connecting federations. And, and by connecting them, we actually get this scale of, of interfederation, which has, has broad benefits to it, um, rather than trying to kind of grow one large federation or have separate federations happening all over. We, we get a benefit of just connecting them all um, through a baseline of certification and, and agreed upon policies and, and technical deployments. So trust framework. And I don't know how many people are familiar with trust framework, so I'll, I'll give the, the overview. Um, in the trust framework model, you have a certification process. You have an assessment that's performed uh, to a baseline of criteria. 
uh, which are assessed against. You have a verification process to make sure that that, that assessment um, was valid and that would, uh, procedures were followed. And when a assessment is complete, then a registration occurs, a registration of the, of the uh, outcome of that assessment, the, the date, the length, um, the, the level of, of trust that assessment has, the level of assurance, um, and also the registration of the metadata for that service, the, the identity service that has been assessed. So the, the metadata that's, that, that, that service that is passing, so let's say if it's SAML metadata, so if that metadata goes into something that we call a listing service. So it's a listing service or a registry, and that registry is able to pass that metadata through to interested parties or relying parties. And Contara is, is a body that we actually do the accreditation of auditors. So we have our baseline core set of documents and we audit the auditors to make sure that they're able to perform those assessments. And then when we have a, a, a identity provider, a credential service provider who has passed that assessment, we uh, have partnered with the Open Identity Exchange to be that um, kind of interfederation operator. So they are the listing service that actually holds the technical data um, which then gets passed through the federations. So all this is built upon levels of assurance. Uh, levels of assurance is something that was uh, crafted in the uh, NIST special publication 863. It's really a way to measure, um, to, to provide a risk assessment. It's a way to measure risk and then measure the need for how high of assurance you would need to mitigate that risk in an information transaction. So you can see there are four levels. Level one is something that's very low risk, doesn't have a lot of, um, it's not going to hurt your reputation. It's not going to hurt financially if, if something goes wrong in a level one scenario. A level four scenario, though, uh, an assurance level four, um, is a very high risk scenario. So when an audit is performed, the criteria goes from a lower baseline uh, that needs to be met for a level one to a much higher baseline up through a level four um, to, to be able to assure trust in that transaction, in that service. So at Cantara, we've developed the Identity Assurance Framework, and the Identity Assurance Framework um, has had contributions from uh, uh, Liberty Alliance, has had contributions from the e-authentication partnership, and has been aligned uh, with the intent of 863 uh, levels of assurance as well. Um, the Identity Assurance Framework is really a component of Trust Framework. Uh, providing the operational policies uh, which, a, which a service will be certified against. So it's a way to measure what I'll call operational interoperability. So who is this organization? Can we trust them? Uh, do, they have, do they have a board that meets? Does that board take minutes? Do they approve those minutes? Do they have a privacy policy, a remediation policy? All of these kinds of things are, are go into um, operational interoperability and measuring trust in the organization. Um, so the actors uh, who, who the IAF applies to are the assessors. So those assessors uh, review the IAF and they, and they, one of the documents in the IAF stack is, is, um, is an equivalencies document. So an auditor can uh, re reuse or leverage a uh, certification, say a AICPA or ISACA, and, and use that, that other certification to to move forward with a Kantara assessment. So we have levels of equivalencies that we um, can award uh, for various other pre-certifications or uh, non-Kantara uh, certifications. So those accredited assessors, uh, once they become accredited, uh, go are able to then perform audits against our framework. Um, the IAF has the something called the SACs. That's the Service Assessment Criteria. That's the criteria that a service is, is audited against. So uh, an identity provider, a credential service provider, who's seeking to become certified would look at the service assessment criteria
criteria. Um, first, they would do their risk profile and really figure out what, what kind of risk transactions, what kind of information transactions they're doing or they want to do. Um, and then they would review the service assessment criteria to see if they're actually aligning um, with that baseline that they would be certified against. Um, we also have a set of federation operator guidelines that are um, helpful uh, for federation operators to ensure that they're following best practices as part of uh, the scenario, as part of a federation circle of trust. So this is just a little illustration to kind of give you maybe a visual idea. There's a core set of IAF documents and that set makes up the, the IAF stack. The Identity Assurance Framework, or IAF, um, is actually shepherded through its life cycle through a work group called the Identity Assurance Work Group that has stakeholders from a broad range of, of industry verticals and, um, and international uh, stakeholders who actually make sure that the IAF has a, a group to shepherd it and bring it through its life cycle, make updates if needed, um, and, and manage the document set. The certification program, the assurance uh, accreditation and certification program is overseen by the Assurance Review Board, which has members who sit on it from um, auditors, government agency policy makers, um, uh, research and education networks uh, and and some special advisors who have been working on this uh, working on the trust framework uh, core for for quite a while, so we have a broad set of 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 experts, subject matter experts, on the Assurance Review Board who oversee the program. And they're the ones that make a recommendation in terms of accrediting an auditor um, and reviewing a report from a, an accredited auditor uh, to, to make a re recommendation for certification for an assessment that's been performed. And then at the top of the pyramid is the Kintara Board of Trustees. And the Board of Trustees will review recommendations that the Assurance Review Board provides. And uh, provided that they uh, agree with that recommendation and, and, um, and are aligned with that recommendation, they will ratify uh, an accreditation or a certification to move forward. And at that point, um, our trust status list partner, OIX, um, is, is notified of a certification that occurs and that enables the, the identity provider to be, their metadata to be listed uh, with an organization like OIX, and in our case, OIX. So this is an example of, of a trust framework um, and kind of what are the components of the trust framework and, and how do they apply? So uh, who do they apply to as well? So we have a technical component. So it deals, uh, currently it's working around uh, SAML, OpenID, potentially OAuth. Um, it's something, it's a trust framework is, is can be aimed specifically at social networks or industry verticals like healthcare or financial, um, as well as jurisdictions, be they, uh, if federating or interfederating local governments or local government agencies as well as as internationally and then the the trust framework um, the trust framework needs a, a listing component because that's the component that um, that enables that interfederation that I was talking about. So in our case, we've partnered with Open Identity Exchange. Um, we understand that there will probably be, be more types of listing services that we'll be developing um, as this work, uh, um, as the component, the listing service component matures. So I talked about the core, um, the core IAF documents, and some of you may be thinking, okay, well, um, how does this all fit together? Uh, so we have the core set of documents that's really operational and, and seeks to be uh, technology agnostic. So it allows technology to plug in based upon the context of the risk or the level of assurance. Um, you layer in with that a technical profile and the technical profile is uh, what the, the, the identity providers who want to be a part of that trust framework, what they'll have to deploy what, and the, the deployment profile that will enable them to be uh, technically interoperable. And again, that could be SAML, OpenID, potentially WSR. 
then there are privacy profiles. So for example, we start with the, the core IAF and we could add in a SAML web SSO profile. Um, we've been working with the US government uh, as they are using Kantara as the certifying body up to level three assurance uh, for industry credentials to interact with U.S. government agencies. And so in this case, the U.S. government said, okay, we have specific privacy constraints that we want to ensure apply to our trust framework um, members. So we have developed a specific U.S. privacy profile. We see this model as being able to um, leverage the gaps across the different uh, jurisdictions, across the different privacy constraints in different countries. So there could easily be a Swedish profile or, or an EU uh, specific specific profile or a Japan profile um, to leverage those regional jurisdictional differences. And when you put all those pieces together, you have a complete framework with assessment criteria that all members are assessed against the same criteria, which allows both operational interoperability and technical interoperability, which all enables trust. So the work that we do, um, collaboration is, is a key to, to getting all of this work done. Um, we, we collaborate uh, with, with many organizations. I mentioned in the beginning the um, international standards bodies, the OAX. Uh, we have members and collaborate and partners with uh, um, research networks uh, like In Common, Internet2, uh, Terena, Refeds. So, so we have many collaborations that we do, and, and again, going back to the core concept of acting as a bridge, collaboration is a key for everything that we do. Um, this is kind of an example of specifically how we collaborate with the Open Identity Exchange, where Kantara has a set of work groups um, that is that is working to foster this trust framework. Um, we've already got the the, the IAF in version 2.0, uh, so it's it's had a, a history uh, as well vetted um, and is is ready today for adoption. Um, and we work with the OIX as the listing service, and we also work with them as well as other stakeholders in terms of helping to define um, how to move forward at an internet scale toward interfederation. And, and I think some of our other uh, presenters will, will talk a bit about that today as well. So where are we going in terms of building on the core? Um, I can tell you that we, we do have a, already an assessor who's through the program. Uh, we have a, a, another assessor who's working to come through now, and we have uh, th at least three uh, large IDPs who are working to come through at a level three as well. Um, so, so what we have today is ready and is operational. That said, there are more pieces to be, to be defined, and there's more work that we can do. Um, specifically, the privacy and public policy work group in Kantara is developed developing a core set of privacy uh, assessment criteria, uh, which could apply uh, with, with, the, with the mission and the underlying goal that the work that they do will be applicable and will be a baseline uh, for international privacy constraints. So s some issues maybe need to be solved through profiling, but we're trying to kind of create a baseline here around privacy, which can be tricky. Um, something that, that's also important with our stakeholders is how to move forward on attribute management. Um, what's, what kind of core definition will we reach on, on even what con constitutes an attribute um, and how to, uh, uh, how to move forward from there. And, and so one of the things we do at Kantara as well is we try not to create new layers of standards. We know that there are a lot of standards out there and there are a lot of standards being worked on. So often when a group is formed, one of the first things that they'll do is a discovery phase and a gap analysis. And our attribute management group is formed and they're now working to um, discover all of the different uh, attribute management uh, work that's happening potentially in other organizations out there, uh, capture an analysis of what's out there and being worked on, and then identify if there are some gaps that, that could be filled that Kantara should work to fill, um, or potentially work to liaise with an organization who may be making progress around attribute management already. 
Um, we also have a, a stakeholders who are very interested in a set of guidelines for relying parties. Um, so what kind of ba best practices should relying parties be following who are participating with those identity providers and with, the, in, in, and with those federations? So I won't go completely through this, but again, I, I think it's going to be available after, but it just these two slides give a flow of how the accreditation process works. Um, the good news is, maybe that looks a little bit complicated, but you contact us and we walk you through the process. Um, so we have a, a small staff um, who make sure that uh, who make sure that our members and that identity providers or auditors who are looking to be accredited or certified. Um, they have our support uh, to work through that. And through our very small staff and our uh, large network of volunteers, uh, we're able to make these certifications happen and we're able to make progress on issues through our work groups as well. So the benefits uh, to adoption of the trust framework model. Uh, one of the benefits is that it applies already, uh, it, it applies to federations that are already operating. So the trust framework model doesn't mean that you have to go back and get rid of all of the work that you've already done uh, or are seeking to do in your federation. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to change the technology that you've deployed. Uh, it just means that you need to uh, choose a specific profile against the technology that you've already deployed uh, to, to uh, provide interoperability, a, a baseline of measure for interoperability for your, your federation. Um, so it enables the work that's already been done to be leveraged. It enables cost saving through federation. We know that federation has a high cost saving and return of investment. Um, it enables trust to be able to, um, to be, be uh, certified to a baseline of criteria. Um, it enables trust in that federation community as well and the end user who's accessing those services. Um, and it enables a, a connection with a network of like-minded organizations uh, who will work together to, to also bring these standards forward or identify uh, where gaps or profiles need to be, um, need, need attention and, and need to be revised. So current status, um, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are, Kantara is a uh, U U.S. government, U.S. federal government trust framework provider. That means that the uh, U.S. federal government decided that they wanted to uh, use this trust framework model and use, uh, use the federation model um, to enable citizens to leverage those industry issued credentials. Uh, they reviewed a number of organizations and they chose Kantara as uh, the, uh, the organization who can provide uh, certifications through level three. Uh, so we're already doing this today and for our level threes we're using uh, this, a SAML profile. Uh, there's also an open ID profile in the US framework and I believe a WS trust profile as well but those don't go up to level three and SAML does. Um, if you're asking why not level four, in the US government they have a specific program around federal PKI, federal bridge. Um, that program they, they don't want to touch today. So uh, this program is really specifically to leverage um, non-PKI and non-hard token solutions uh, and, and industry credentials as a way to move forward. Um, so we're doing the work with the U.S. government. We've been working uh, in Kantara. We have members uh, and participants from uh, governments and agencies, including uh, U.S. government, Canada, New Zealand, Denmark, um, uh, Sweden. Uh, so we have a, a broad range of, of governments who are members and who are actively bringing in requirements and working with us on specific concerns for their region. Um, and we've been referenced by a number of these governments through um, RFPs, through through recent studies, um, and uh, through, through programs uh, like the uh, U.S. federal program. Um, and we've also been uh, taking part heavily uh, in the, in the the recent U.S. NSTIC program, where we've been, uh, NSTIC is the National Strategy for Trusted Identities. Uh, and one thing that Kantara brings, um, the last bullet there is international partners. One thing that Kantara brings in regard to the, the developing U.S. Um, 
<clears throat> national strategy is that we use our broad set of industry and international stakeholders to ensure that um, the, the U.S. strategy is not developing as a silo. Um, we strongly feel that, that uh, countries uh, um, not in the U.S. have uh, had big successes around federation and have been able to deploy and can tell great success stories in terms of savings and in terms of how federation can actually benefit um, uh, countries like especially I've been learning a lot about in Sweden uh, where I understand you've all uh, or most of you but I think you've all been issued a level three credential already through your banking system um, so Countries like Sweden are excellent examples of, of kind of environments that are ready and can really provide a leading example that uh, the U.S. could look to and potentially adopt and use as, a, as, a, as an example of, of a proof of concept on how this works. So the lessons learned so far, um, sometimes I say I feel like we've done 90% of the work and there's 90% more work to do. Uh, so we've, we've come very far, but we still have a way to go. And we all know that the internet is an environment that's constantly changing uh, and, and needs to be developed a, as a, a living, breathing organism. Um, and so there are, are, cha are always layers that we can add and layers that we can um, focus on as the internet changes as the use of the internet changes um, in, in different contexts. So uh, we are seeking uh, more memberships and more partners and customers to help contribute to our work, um, to help us uh, ensure that we're working in the right direction for stakeholders and that we're, we're really helping to move uh, this community forward and move digital identity uh, standards forward. Um, we can use more uh, technical frameworks, more technical profiles uh, as, as uh, protocols are developing or becoming stable new protocols. Um, we may need to look at levels of assurance. Um, there may be a scenario where uh, the, the levels of assurance that have been defined may need to be redefined for, for a, a strong uh, case from a s industry segment or a set of stakeholders. So that's something that we're, we're able to do and, and look at. Um, and we would need additional privacy profiles as well to, um, to leverage those jurisdictional differences uh, around the different privacy constraints. So um, I will be here for the whole day, and you can certainly come and talk to me. Um, I think this uh, presentation will be available. You can find all of our work and our and our documentation online, um, and you can always reach out to me uh, because I'm very happy to talk to you all about what we're doing, to learn about what you're doing, um, and how we might work together to 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 move federation and, and move our work forward. So I just want to say taksumike and. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have some time for uh, questions. Uh, sure. <laughs> Dari, could you, uh, while you're thinking about the questions, may I ask one? Sure. Uh, do you have any Swedish members? We do. We do. We have Swedish members in this room, in fact. Um, uh, we have Sunnet, we have Ericsson, uh, we, have, we have Swedish members, we have Scandinavian members, we have Finnish members, we have Danish members, uh, so we're represented in that way. So who, should you, uh, who, who should you want to be a member if you, and anyone else you would like to be a member in Kantari? In this room? Um, everyone. <laughs> How much does it cost? Um, so our membership is at a fee scale. It's very reasonable for nonprofit organizations, nonprofit, non-government organizations. It's also reasonable uh, where fees have been set based upon the size of the organization. I can talk to each of you more about that, but we do try to scale those membership fees so that uh, we have a low barrier and that you can very easily get involved and, and network and work with us. And as a member, you're supposed to contribute to the work, or are there also benefits you can? Yes, yes. Um, so members can contribute to the work, as much of the work as they want. They could also just watch email lists. Some people like to do that instead. Um, and uh, members have votes in terms of organizational recommendations. So the identity assurance framework is a, is a 
set of documents that has been voted on by the entire organization, all of the members. Um, members also get uh, reviews in terms of the, the liaisons that I talked about, so the ISO documents and the ITUT documents. Um, documents that prob may not be available um, to those organizations otherwise. So, so that's a specific benefit that you get access to documents that are confidential, not because they're our confidential documents, but those international bodies have confidentiality associated with them. So that's also helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Yeah. Please use the microphone. Uh, who, if any, uh, of key players are not involved in the Kantara initiative? Who are some of the key players that are not involved in the Kantara initiative? Um, one area that we would like to see more engagement in terms of key players specifically are the relying parties. Uh, we have many of the identity providers, we have the research networks, we have the governments, uh, we have the, the federation operators, and one community that I think we could use um, m more input from in order to uh, provide more value for that piece of federation are the relying parties. That's a set of, of organizations that we would like to see uh, more participation from. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, a question about cost saving. Mm -hmm. So in my view, uh, federations enable things very easily, like email enables quick and, and, and huge amounts of, of, uh, of conversation. Uh, federations enable uh, service providers and huge amounts of service providers in, in a structured way. Uh, have you seen the cost saving been cut from budgets so, so uh, anywhere? Or is the cost saving actually a benefit or a cost containment uh, framework that we is it a cost containment framework that we're building, which actually you can translate into uh, potential money, uh, but not a, a real saving? Because I think there might be confusion if you build a federation and say we 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 saved let's say half a million or ten million or ten trillion uh, krona euros dollars, mm -hmm. then that should in principle be cut somewhere. But have you seen that happen, or is this a, a, a number that we sort of grab in the air based on, on, on facts, of course, of integration costs and operational costs and so on? But has this actually been, been cut somewhere in bodies? Do you know of that? Um, so if I understand, I, I would say that uh, we do have the data in terms of some of the use cases of what's been saved. Um, we have data in terms of what can be saved, uh, particularly around the, uh, the, the Canadian, um, the Canadian best cloud best practices white paper that I was mentioning. Um, they're talking in the billions and they only, they looked at a certain set of servers and if they applied that to all of the servers throughout the country, you would have huge cost savings. But um, that said, you would also have uh, the return of investment of bringing in more, uh, bringing in, enabling more citizens to interoperate with those government services, which then has uh, a different exponential uh, effect. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question perf perfectly, but I think that uh, we have seen some cost savings. We've seen some areas of potential revenue. Um, there's an example uh, within, uh, there's a, our Japanese member has shared an example with me where um, <clears throat> Japan Airlines uh, is, a, is a relying party. There is an identity provider in Japan uh, who, uh, who's federated and they, Japan Airlines accepts their, that identity provider's credential and every time the, uh, every time they accept that credential from that identity provider, they pay that identity provider cents upon the transaction. Um, so there's also opportunity to, to bring in some revenue as well uh, for the different actors. So it's a, a bit of a cost savings, a potential bit of revenue, um, and definitely a way to um, expand that base and, and see just how far we can go in terms of citizen engagement and, and uh, uh, 
end user engagement in these services. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, thank you.